Hello, Internet. This is not Canada. Sometimes. Sometimes, this is Canada. Allow me to explain. At the time of making this video, there's a federal election coming up in Canada, and being Canadian myself, I have a bit of an interest in how it goes, so I try to keep informed. In order to be informed, I need information, and in order for that information to get from somewhere else to me, it needs to be packaged in some way that I can understand. Maybe I'm listening to someone's speech, maybe I'm reading an article, or maybe I'm looking at a map. Maps are popular tools for representing data, and are used all the time. Hey look, here's one of the 2019 federal election results. Wait a second, if the Red Party got that many seats, then where are they? Well, the answer in this case is that they're in cities, which are way too small to see on the large map. People try to solve this by adding extra little sections showing individual cities, but it's still really hard to actually understand what's going on here. Quick aside on how voting works here, Canada is split up into a bunch of electoral districts or ridings, and people within these districts vote for a representative for that district. The representative with the most votes wins that district, and in the end, the party that has the most elected representatives will be the party in power. This gives us a hint at what the problem here might be, namely the fact that it's people who are voting, and not land area. This map is showing the geographical distribution of the ridings, but how many people are in each riding? Let's take a look at this graph. The ridings are split up in such a way to try and keep the populations per riding roughly equal in order to provide as equal representation as possible. You can see here that the majority of the ridings here have between 100,000 and 120,000 people. Okay, so that's interesting, but it's not the real cause of the problem. The main issue with maps like these is the population density. There are as many people living in this whole area as there are in one of these tiny sections that are already super enlarged in the image. Now that has some real-world implications in terms of political representation, but for now I'm just concerned with the data representation. If we instead create a map where all the writings are the same visual size, then all of a sudden the picture becomes much clearer. Of course we lose some information about geographic distribution, but we gain the ability to see all of the writings at the same time. If we wanted to, then, we could scale these to make the areas proportional to the actual populations of those writings. Now we have a map of all the electoral districts accurately representing the population and which party was elected. Now, this has already been done. There are maps like this one and this one that have already been made, but we're not done yet. This map still doesn't tell us the whole story, because for any given writing, the entire population obviously didn't just all vote for one party. But that's kind of how the map makes it seem. If we include all of the votes and display it so that for each riding, the area taken up by the different colors is exactly proportional to the proportion of people who voted for those parties, then we can actually see what's going on. We get much more information, and we can see if it was a close race or if one party had almost all the votes. We can see who was in second, and in general it just gives us a better representation of the data in question, and I don't think it has quite the same potential to be misleading, unlike the traditional maps you see all over the place. Now I'm not saying we should get rid of the regular maps, those are still very useful, but if the question we're trying to answer is, how did Canadians vote in the last election, or how are Canadians going to vote in the next election, then the better answer isn't this, it's this. Thanks for watching, I'll see you in the next video.